Welcome back to Asian Art. Today we're going to look at Javanese masks and how they convey character and the ideas of personalities in traditional Javanese theater. To begin with, I want to go back to what we were talking about in our last lecture, where I showed you how the shadow puppets of Bali were distinctly different than the shadow puppets of Java. And I asked the question how that came to be. We can see a similar difference in the mass traditions. We see the Balinese Toping Pajigan on the left. The face is naturalistic. The eyes and mouth and lips and nose are all proportional like a natural face. Whereas if we look at the Javanese mask on the right, we notice a much greater stylization in the eyes and the shape of the face. There's as if a kind of a distance to the natural world. The reasons for those differences reside in the changes that took place in Java following the collapse of the Mojapayat era. At that time, Islam enters into Java and the whole of the island and eventually the whole of the archipelago converts to Islam. Bali, however, remains Hindu. The aesthetic interest of Islam, which is opposed to, to representations of human beings and living things on the idea that they were trying to imitate God's unique power. That the difference here is a kind of movement away from things that appear like real life and creating a more symbolic relationship to the natural world. And so as the tradition of naturalism uh, continues in Bali, more stylized art forms emerge in Java with the influence of Islam. Now, both of these masks from Bali and Java represent a very similar kind of character type. They re represent a sort of refined, noble character who is modest and selfless. And so in Bali, they refer to this kind of character as manis, which means sweet. And in Java, they refer to this kind of character as halus, refined, supple, soft, like silk or fine cotton. Refined characters in Java represent a number of characteristics. This particular mask is one of the most refined of characters and is often called panji after the hero of the Panji legends, where you have a character who is influential and a lover and is a great artist and also very modest and, and sort of has a mystical relationship to the world with meditation and the assumption of mystical powers through contemplation. The figure appears neither strongly male or female, has a kind of egoless androgyny. And this is an important quality in this figure, is not to sort of press or over-determine themselves. They sort of hold a kind of neutral place in the world and allow the world to pass over and by them without acting on it. Panji, as a performed by that we find in the Javanese traditions, is a little less refined than Panji. And here we have a character called Pamindo, who is more clearly feminine. Pamindo has a little more hair on the head, the eyes are a little more open, the mouth a little bit larger, more expressive. And this is called a semi-refined character. It is a character who is, while still modest, more energetic, more, as they say, bird-like, flighty, impulsive, acting in the world in a way that 
Panji would not. Pambindo, as you see here, still stands on the arms near the body and moves, but in a quick way, sort of in a, a mincing step and sort of looking about actively. We can see Pamindo with a sort of generous smile and wider eyes. It's a character who is vigorously interested in everything in the world, but still has some degree of modesty and refinement. The next character on our spectrum of characters in the Wyong Topeng of Java is the more clearly Kasar character, the rugged characters. This one called Tumungong is masculine and heroic and uh, takes action. This would be a minister, a person who has been called on by their refined king to go to the border and seek what is happening and assess the nature of the trouble. So the Tumagon character is an active presence in the story. He is a character that is out in the wilderness. His body stance is wider. His arms stretch out. He takes big, long strides, but he does so with a kind of grace and slow and solemnity that shows that he is both powerful and somewhat restrained in his movements. Here are some other examples of Tumungung-like characters. Notice that they have larger eyes, facial hair, and a color which is a little bit bolder and more distinctive than both Pamindo and Panji. Lastly, we get to our most emotional of characters, Clono. Clono represents a character who is very clearly Kassar. They are obviously masculine, they act in selfish ways, they are magical, they are willing to manipulate things to their own ends, and they have large gestures that they whip around and they take command of the stage in a snake-like writhing fashion. Clonal characters, you see with their bulging eyes and their bright red face and their long nose and their big teeth, they represent sort of an extravagant and wealthy king who is, desires everything they want, want to have in the world, including other men's wives. Clonal characters you see here have a very wide stance and their hands come up high on their head and their shoulders and they, they strut around and they show off their finery as they dance. The clonal character you see here is being danced by a very famous dancer, Irawati Dupran from Chiribon. She was famous for her depictions of the clonal character. And I point this out because the clonal character is not, even though it is a male character, is not necessarily just something that men experience. Clono is an aspect of characters that we all have within us. The Javanese believe this because at our birth, all four of these character types appear to us. They are our siblings, they say. So, at birth, the first thing that happens to a woman that is pregnant, about to give birth, is that her water breaks and it emerges out of her from the birth sac, and that is Panji. Then we have the birth sac, which is Pamindo. We have the umbilical cord, which is Tumungum. And then, last of all to emerge, is Clono the bloody placenta. And so these three parts of the birth process are seen as sort of aspects of every individual. So no matter whether you're a male or female, we all possess the ability to find these characters within us. Outside the four main characters, 
there are a few other character types that are often thought of as even consisting outside the tradition, and there's much more fanciful in their designs. There are the Buddha and the Raksasa. These are the henchmen and servants of the demon kings, the Klonos, and they are the ones that have a kind of witless uh, attachment to power, and they follow along in the footsteps of the Klono character, not asking wherefore or why they must do some evil deed or another, only that they do as they are commanded. The word Buddha means blind. And so this is a kind of foolish and powerful demon or monster that is out in the world acting on others' evil intent. The other character type that is very common in Wyong are the Punakawan. We've talked about them now in various guises in Bali. And in Java, they also have a very important role to play. Uh, they come out and they act as sort of villagers and ordinary people in this heroic landscape, commenting on things as we, anybody might, who is confused and wondering about what's going on and trying to make sense of it all. But unlike the Balinese Punakawan, who translate what is said by their heroes. The Javanese Punakawan do not have an active role in translating the text because the heroes speak, while in a fancy language, they still speak a language that most Javanese can understand. And so the Punakawan, their role is slightly different than that of those found in Bali. These two, Petruk and Gereng, are brothers, and they are often featured in various guises in many different forms of Wayang. Speaking of different forms of Wayang, let's look how these character types we see in the mass tradition can also be found elsewhere in Wayang. One type of Wayang that we know exists in Bali and Java is the Wayang Kulit, the shadow puppets. Kulit means leather or skin, and Wayang Kulit are these stretched leather puppets. Notice the uh, beautiful gold and delicate incised lines that define the figure. The shapes are more abstract. The arms are longer. The other really telling difference between Balinese and Javanese puppets is you'll notice that the control rod, called the gapet, that you hold the puppet, is curved. In Balinese puppets, this is a wooden stick that is always straight. In Javanese puppets, they cleverly take a buffalo horn and they heat and melt it so that its shape is sinuous and twisted and so that it only sort of flows along the design of the puppet. Here we see the Dalang, the puppeteer in Java, who is the one performer who does all of the actions of the puppets. He does the narration and all the voices, and he's also responsible for conducting the orchestra. So the Dalang is this very central role of the performance and plays a key part in drawing audiences to the show. Other types of Wayang. There's also a wooden doll puppet called Wayang Golek. This is a carved wood puppet tradition that emerges in Java several hundred years after the arrival of Islam in Java. It is a tradition that is much more recent than the shadow puppet theater. It's not really based on the shadow puppets so much as a puppet theater that's based on performers. So it's a, a kind of performers who act like puppets are now being made. And that puppets, the uh, performers acting like puppets, we call that Wayang Wong, or sometimes referred to as Wayang Orang. Wong and Orang are the same word, means person. And here we see people acting like puppets. This, of course, is the god Shiva, 
or as they call him in Java, Bittara Guru. And in a live performance, uh, is acting out this role. Now, these performances performed uh, with live actors uh, are very expensive to mount and require lots of costumes. And it wasn't really until the 20th century that they became fairly popular and widespread throughout Java. But they do perform uh, on a very regular basis and are quite lovely and beautiful counterpoint to the Wayang traditions, puppet traditions of Java. So let's look at these different kinds of Wayang and compare them to each other according to these basic character types. To begin with, when we want to look at a Halus character, you'll notice that a Halus character in Wayang Toping, Wayang Kulit, Wayang Golek, and Wayang Wong all exhibit the same kind of characteristics. They are of small eyes, nose, and mouth. They have a downcast head. They have small bodies. They have modest ornamentation. They're not as colorful or as extravagant as any of the other characters. When we compare the Kassar characters, we can see they are opposite in so many ways. They are big-bodied, they have bulging eyes, they have bright red faces, they have lots of facial hair, they have giant crowns and ornamentation, they are ostentatious. So whether it's Wang Toping, Wang Kulit, Wang Golek, or Wang Wong, these same character types reoccur in each. And lastly, we can see the same kinds of characters emerge in the Punakawa, on the clown characters. They have these sort of goofy expressions, long noses, funny complexions, bulging eyes, goofy grins, and they move in a kind of awkward, lopsided way. And this is the way in which the Wyong world, despite its many different forms, has this extraordinary continuity and these different traditions kind of feed off each other so that performers from one know how to understand and read performances of other traditions.